we're now ready to jump in to proving the lemma that we showed in the previous video, where we're going to show, according to this decomposition, that the GCD of A and B is equal to the GCD of B and R. In mathematics, when you're proving inequality, you actually tend to go about this very frequently in an inadvertent way. And one way to prove an equality of two integers, because the notation is clunky, but these are integers after all. One way to show that two integers are equal is to show that one is less than or equal to the other, and then to show the reverse. So we will take that approach in this particular proof. And this is a very common tactic. It's one that you may have seen previously when you were showing the equality of sets. That's another common practice there as well show that the set A is a subset of the set B, and then show that the set B is a subset of the set A. We'll first show that the GCD of A and B is less than or equal to the GCD of B and R, and then we will show the reverse inequality, that the GCD of B and R is less than or equal to the GCD of A and B. So the first thing we do is we make the technique that we're going to take known to the reader of the proof. The second thing that I'm going to do, which is not a requirement of this proof, but I think is a good proof writing technique, is I'm going to introduce variables to stand for the GCD of A and B and the GCD of B and R. And I'm going to use my first available letters to me, D and E, to represent those values. This would maybe be more practical if we were writing on a blackboard, but it's a lot to say the GCD of A and B. And it's a lot to write the GCD of A and B on paper or on a board. And so this is just a nice way to make our writing look a little bit more concise. Both of these things I've written in black, and I think that they qualify as black. They're directional statements, and they're an introduction of notation that is of my invention that didn't come from the statement of the lemma. So I think it's appropriate for both of these things to be black. Because we have to show two different things, it doesn't really matter which one we do first. What I am going to do is first show that D is less than or equal to E. Again, that's my own decision. We could very well do the other direction first. And this is just a, we need to do something, so this is what I'll do. So again, the appropriate color is black. The next thing we do is we dive in to doing some actual mathematical computations and not just some of the writing components of our proof. Very generally, I've chosen the colors green and red for assumptions and conclusions because we very frequently should start a proof with green and end a proof with red. The first thing you should do whenever you're proving something is say, what do I have to use? What are the tools that I have to work towards my result? Because D is the greatest common divisor of A and B, there are three things that we know about D. And these things are given to us because D is standing for the GCD of A and B. The three things that we know about D come from the definition of the greatest common divisor of two integers. And so if we went back to the slides where we wrote down that definition, there were three parts to that definition. And they were that GCD divides A, it divides B, and it is the largest thing to do both one and two. So all I've really done is made a formal list of the things that I know about D and the things that I am free to use without justification in my proof because they're part of what I'm assuming. However, in my approach to this proof, I'm going to use congruences or equivalences as opposed to using equality in order to lower the number of symbols. And so what I'm gonna do is say, statements one and two are statements about divisibility. But one of the things we've done is introduced modular arithmetic and congruences. And since that's the direction I want to go, we had a lemma or a fact that told us how to translate statements about divisibility into statements about congruences. And appealing to that fact, I want to take one and two from above and I want to rewrite them as congruences. And to say that D divides A, is to say that A is congruent to zero mod D, and similarly for part two, B is congruent to zero mod D. This last statement, statement three, doesn't really have anything to do with modular arithmetic, so it's gonna remain as is for now. Moving on, 
The thing that I have in purple, I'm going to kind of consider a computation. It's a little bit sketchy if that's a computation or not, but it's the next action item that I'm going to do, and I think that it's the closest thing I have to a computation. It's also something of an insight. It's not a thing that I necessarily view as natural. So if we were proving this lemma together as a class in person, this is something I would write down as like, hint, try this. It's the type of thing that you have to practice proofwriting for a while before it becomes intuitive to you. So for either way, what I want to do is take the equation I have. A is equal to QB plus R. And what I would like to do is replace it with a congruence. And a congruence is a weaker thing. And instead of looking at this equation, I want to basically divide everything in sight by D and read this whole equation modulo D. Because I have this equality overall, if I mod everything by D, everything is preserved. A should be congruent to QB plus R, all modulo D. The benefit of doing this is that I just worked hard on the previous slide to determine the values of A and B modulo D. And these things, after applying that lemma, these are equivalent to the 1 and 2 right here. These are things that are given to me that I know. So I can move forward to this congruence and I can make a substitution. What I can do is replace A with what it's congruent to mod D, and I can replace B with what it's congruent to mod D. And those things are an application of facts I already know. So we'll consider that action a green action because I'm using one of the, my assumptions. And when I do that, this congruence mod D becomes this congruence. Zero is congruent to Q times zero plus R. Now I'm going to pause the video right here and I'm going to resume in the next video with the remaining portion of the proof of this lemma and hopefully what that will do is give you an opportunity to reflect on just what we've done so far and if you have any questions on the things that are, have come up in this first video, I'll give you an opportunity to differentiate exactly where your question is. So when we come back, we'll resume right where we are here and just pick up where we left off.